I was honored that near the end of Dwight's career and towards the end of his life, he asked me to speak today. But I have to admit, at a time like this, it's hard to find the right words. So I decided to begin with the, Dwight's own words that he told me. Eddie, it was just a great life. And you know, it really, really was. That's why we're here today, to celebrate the life of Dwight Clark, even as we mourn his passing. Of course, no one has been defined by a singular moment more than Dwight. He is forever remembered for the catch. You all may have heard about it. In the NFC Championship game against the Cowboys, Joe Montana threw the pass so high that it looked like he was throwing the ball away. But he knew Dwight, at six foot four, would find a way, and he leaped so high in the sky to make the game-winning play that did begin our 49ers dynasty. Dwight was asked about it many, many times and always said, what a perfect pass it was. When he would tell that story, Joe would always say, well, then maybe it should have been called the throw. And flashing his trademark smile, Dwight would say, Joe, please, at least give me one play. <laughs> it's one of the most iconic moments in NFL history. And what I think all of us here today should do is remember the many, many special moments that Dwight shared with us all during his life. When I first met Dwight after Bill Walsh selected him in the 10th round from Clemson, he had this southern accent and he was so incredibly good looking with a big smile and infectious laugh. I knew we would instantly be friends. In 1979, I was only 32 years old, and when Dwight and Joe came to the 49ers, they were like my little brothers. I told them to call me Eddie, but Dwight always insisted for years and years, right up until the time that he passed, on calling me boss. They would meet me at the airport when I would fly in from Youngstown, and we would go to the team hotel, sneak down to the bar with Freddie Solomon, and always have a few drinks. Once I had the idea to try and personally negotiate their contracts without using their agents. So I invited them to my home in Youngstown. My friend, Carmen Policy, who was our general counsel and team president, didn't like the idea one bit, but he went along with it. Carmen left about 11 p.m. that night. Dwight, Joe, and I shot pool and drank tequila, probably way more than we should have. Well, I got the deals done. When Carmen saw us at breakfast, sort of beaten up from the night before, he learned I had paid Joe a million dollars and Dwight $500,000. Then Carmen's jaw dropped when he saw Dwight drive off to Carolina in my brand new silver Ferrari. <laughs> Car Carmen looked at me in shock and asked, what the hell happened? All I could say was, they won. <laughs> I have pictures at our ranch in Montana, excuse me, at our ranch in Montana of those two. Joe signed it, thanks a million, and Dwight signed it, thanks a half a million. <laughs> that was Dwight, Dwight, or DC, as so many of his friends and teammates called him. Dwight had a nickname for everyone. Jerry Rice was world, because he had never seen anyone with his skill set in the entire world. 
Freddy Solomon was Casper, like the ghost. And Ronnie Lott was always Bobo. Ronnie joined our team in 1980. He didn't say a lot as a rookie. He became Dwight's, one of his closest friends. And after he won the Super Bowl in Detroit, Dwight gave Ronnie one of his great big bear hugs he was known for and said, what's up, Bobo? It was after that Ronnie said that he realized there are some people who love you unconditionally. That's how Dwight loved everyone, unconditionally. What a moment. A lot of words have been used to describe Dwight, a Southern gentleman, selfless, handsome, humble, caring, courageous, loving, funny. The one I think that best describes him is loyal. Dwight Clark was loyal to every single person he knew. If you met him once, you felt you had known him your entire life. You never forgot that moment. My wife, Candy, and our entire family adored Dwight. My youngest daughter, Nikki, fell for him instantly. He was her first boy crush. Lisa's office was next door to Dwight's when he was general manager, and she ran the 49ers Foundation. Lisa would pop into his office every day to ask a million questions about football, and Dwight was so patient and gracious with her always. Tiffany would play Space Invaders and Pac-Man with him at the team hotel on Saturday nights. When UC Berkeley played Clemson in a bowl game, they had a bet and the loser had to shave their head. If their team lost, thank God Clemson won. <laughs> Tiffany wasn't gonna make Dwight shave his head, but Dwight did it anyway. He shaved his head because that's who Dwight Clark was. Talk about moments. Who can forget him wearing the coyote coat to our Super Bowl parade? He was our Joe Namath without pantyhose. But he never, ever lived down the Adidas poster with the short red pants and the tank top. Dwight actually liked playing the bad guy. He loved vigilante movies, and he watched a lot of them with his dear, dear friend, Rick Winters. Dwight was our Clint Eastwood. There was a safety in Atlanta that I'll never forget. His name was Scott Case, and Dwight would rather hit him all day long than ever catch a pass. Dwight did everything well. He was a great basketball player in high school, and I think he could have been a professional singer. I don't know if he was as good as Huey Lewis, but I think he could have given the news a run for their money. He was always the one who brought the CDs of the latest music on the team plane. Dwight had every gift, but enough years on this earth. When he was diagnosed with ALS, he knew it was a battle he could never, ever win. He fought like hell. He cherished every single moment, every single day. In the end, no matter how tired he was, Dwight rallied. He loved the Tuesday lunches with his teammates in the Bay Area, Dwight Clark Day at Levi Stadium, and the gathering we had in April with our 49er families in Montana. Weakened by this horrible, horrible disease, Dwight didn't want to waste one moment. He gutted it out. We talked about all the games and told some lies about each other. He laughed at the stories of me fighting with fans from the other teams in the stands at away games. Matt Mayoko collected hundreds and hundreds of letters, some of which you heard today from their fans and memories of the catch. 
Dwight had a special relationship with all the 49ers fans. One even sent blades of grass he collected that day in 1981 from Candlestick where the catch was made. When I told Dwight I had the goalpost from the end zone at Candlestick Park moved to my ranch in Montana, he couldn't believe it. On the last day of our Montana reunion, Dwight, Dwight rode his wheelchair from my barn all the way to the goalpost. All of us had our pictures taken in front of it with him. It was one of the final times we would all be together. But even then, Dwight was leaving us all more special moments with him to cherish forever. Dwight's last days were hard. I talked to him nearly every day, and Ronnie and I were with him when he passed. His wife, Kelly, is such a loving wife who cared for him deeply. She rose to the occasion every single moment of every single day. She was his doctor, his nurse, and more than his wife, she was his sweetheart. He loved you, Kelly, and he loved his family. He loved his children, Casey, Mack, and Riley. He loved his brother, Jeff, and his family. He loved his nephews and his beautiful nieces, Meredith, you know how much Dwight loved you, so very, very much. He adored his dogs, who were also with him when he passed. I know he loved me, and I sure loved him. I had a little saying that I wasn't part of this speech that I found last week that I thought was apropos. And it goes like this, and I'm, maybe some of you have heard it but I think it, 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 it's meaningful to me. Don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. ALS took so much from Dwight, but it couldn't break his spirit, and it didn't dare to touch his heart and his great smile. I'm so very thankful that I've had so many moments he left me to cherish. How many of us can say that our best moments were as magnificent as his? Today I can imagine Dwight getting an earful from Bill Walsh and Freddie Solomon listening to Bill go on and on and on about red left slot sprint right option. Although he left us all the way too soon, I know that Dwight was ready to soar again. This time, Dwight Clark has touched the heavens. God bless you, Dwight. We love you, and we always will.